Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Andrew Jones. I'm the uh, Vice President of Sales for the U.S. for LKC Technologies. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar on improving premium cataract surgery outcomes with the Redival. Um, all of us at, here at LKC Technologies hope that you and your families are all safe and healthy during this pandemic. And uh, once again, I'd like to um, thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar this afternoon. Before I introduce our speaker, Dr. Kalatbari, I'd like to quickly review um, how to ask a question using GoToWebinar. So all of the questions today will be submitted using the question function in GoToWebinar. So if you'd like to ask a question, all you need to do is just open up the control panel, open up the question box, type in your question, and what we'll do is we'll stop um, at appropriate points during the presentation and I can pose the questions uh, to Dr. Calabari. So um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dara Calabari. Dr. K um, is uh, how Dr. Calabari likes to be known as. Uh, so Dr. K is a co-owner of the Metrolina Eye Associates in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And Dr. K operates at the Union West Surgery Center the Surgery Center at Edgewater and at CHS Union Hospital. Dr. K graduated uh, magna cum laude from Vanderbilt University with a degree in molecular biology and mathematics. He then attended Duke University for his medical training and completed an internship in internal medicine at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. Dr. K then received his ophthalmology training at Will's Eye Hospital. He has presented at numerous national meetings in ophthalmology and is the author of numerous publications. He is a contributing author to the Will's Eye Manual, the most widely used ophthalmology text in the world. Dr. K is board certified by the American Board of Ophthalmology, and he specializes in cataract surgery, including lens -X ca laser cataract surgery, and various in a minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, including eye stent, goniotomy, and canaloplasty. He is an expert in the use of torque and multifocal intraocular lenses to reduce or eliminate glasses after cataract surgery. Dr. K, thank you very much for presenting today, and um, I'll hand things over to you uh, to begin the presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, everybody can hear me, hopefully. So uh, they tell me that over 100 people have signed up to listen to me talk about this device. That was amazing to me. I had to tell my wife because at home, I can't seem to get anybody to listen to me. So I'm going to speak to you today about an exciting and innovative device from LKC technology is called the Retival device. It is an electroretinography or ERG device. I will talk to you about some basics on ERG, but don't worry, we're not gonna get too technical. Uh, I'll talk about how we use the device in our practice. We've had ERG in our practice now for about six or seven years. We've had this device in our practice for about two or three years. So we started with a single device but we all loved it so much, we ended up getting six of them, one for each of our offices. I'll give some examples on how I use the device. I'll also list other uses, and we'll also briefly discuss billing. Okay, so why haven't we been using ERG much in ophthalmology? Uh, after all, our cardiology and neurology colleagues have been using electrophysiology studies for nearly a century. Uh, we as ophthalmologists are really behind. Uh, why is that? Well, I think there's two main reasons. One, in ophthalmology, we have the advantage of looking. We, you know, we can examine the inside of the eye by looking into the eye. That's why imaging such as photos, fluorescein, and OCT have really been the mainstay in diagnostics. I am convinced, however, that anatomy is not everything. Uh, it does not tell the whole story. There are processes going on in the retina that we can't see. Uh, I want to convince you to the possibilities for ophthalmology with this technology. Why else do we lag behind our cardiology and neurology colleagues? Well, ERG of the eye has been cumbersome. It was confined to the lab or to the most specialized academic centers. Uh, I like to tell the story about how I first became interested in ERGs. Uh, in medical school, I did rabbit research and I had to perform ERGs on rabbits. And as you can imagine, that was fun. So the way you do it is you make the rabbits uh, sleepy and you put them in a dark room and you put contact lenses. Yes, there are contact lenses for rabbits. You put them in their eye and these contact lenses have little wires that come out and you connect it to the machine and you put the rabbit uh, in the machine. It's about the size of a small dishwasher and it's a lot of work. You run it, but after all that work, you get this magical little number. 
So that was the past. The new device is nothing like the past. You still get that magical little number, but it's much, much easier. And I really think this new device has been a game changer. So here's a new way to perform electrophysiology testing. Okay, so here is a, a picture of the device, the tests being run on a patient, and there's an electrode on the eye. And I'll go over a little bit about the experience for the technician and the patient, but uh, let's take a step back first. What is electroretinography? Basically, you stimulate the eye, bright flash or a flicker, and the electrode that you place near the eye measures the, the electrical response of various cell types in the retina, including photoreceptors, the inner retinal cells, which is the ones that we care about the most for most of our studies that we do at our practice, the, the, the retinal studies, and of course, the ganglion cells in glaucoma. So here's a little bit of the, the physics, the biology, if you will. I'm not going to get too technical, but I just kind of want to show you. It's kind of a neat little animation. So light enters the eye, hits the retina. So if you look, there's a wave, electrical waveform that's generated. Okay, so that's called the A wave. That's primarily a photoreceptor function. We, you know, for our studies, we don't really uh, look at that. It's the next part, the B wave. And the B wave is this big positive wave. It comes from the bipolar cells and it's um, part of the inner retina. Now we'll talk about this a lot. And then finally, there is a component of the wave called the photopic negative response. It is the function of the innermost retinal layer. This is part of the ganglion cell response, which of course we look at for glaucoma. Okay, so let's talk about this device. It's the first and only FDA cleared non-midriatic uh, handheld device. Um, neat things about it, fixation is not required. So the patient doesn't have to be cooperative. That's great. Uh, works with media opacities, cataracts, uh, uh, corneal scars, vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, it easily integrates into your current workflow. Literally, the test takes two minutes. For us, I come out of the room, I ask the testing tech to run the test. She runs it. Five minutes later, it's imp imported into my EMR. I'm looking at it. Um, so patients don't have to be dilated. That's, that's what's great. Um, but if they are, you can also use the test. So there's a setting for each, so uh, each situation. And it's really simple, uh, simple to use for the technicians. You really only have to do one or two tests to learn how to do it. It's really simple for the physicians. Okay, so what is the experience for the technician? What is the experience for the patient? So uh, if you look all the way to the right, you can see what an actual sensor strip looks like on a patient. Uh, they're very gentle, easy to put on, and simple to put on. Technicians, again, for this, they only need to do it once or twice and they'll learn it. Uh, there is an eye cup that goes on for the patient. So the patient's uh, side, uh, it's soft, it's very gentle. I've never had a patient complain about this test. So then bright flashes come on. Now, because of the bright flashes, we do screen our patients for seizure history. So if there's, if there's a significant <clears throat> excuse me, seizure history, we try to avoid the test, uh, but it's very rare. And there's a docking station, which makes it really easy. The device is portable. so. Okay, so the purpose of this slide is twofold. One, I want to show you the science is there. Um, the other point of the slide is if you look at the dates on the studies, it's, it's kind of sad in a way. I mean, these are all recent studies. And so it just shows you how far behind ophthalmology is from the other specialties in medicine in using electrophysiology. Okay, so now let's jump into what does this test produce? Now, at first, it's overwhelming. There's a lot of information in there. Don't worry. 90% of it, you don't need to look at. You don't need to worry about it. Okay, so this is your typical test that you'll run for retinal diseases. Uh, we call it the 30 hertz implicit time. And basically, if you look on the bottom, this is where the B waves are generated, um, reported from the test. And we look at the implicit time. The implicit time is the time it takes for that B wave to reach its peak. So this is the inner retinal function, bipolar cells. When does it reach its peak? And the, 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 the wonderful thing about the implicit time, it's really hard to mess it up. Meaning the technician, if the electrodes aren't perfect or somehow 
um, the, the patient, if they have makeup on their face and if you don't get a good uh, signal, if you can get any signal at all, the implicit time is always the same. It's very accurate, reproducible, uh, very valid. Okay, if you can get a measurement, uh, it is a valid uh, result. So implicit time is, is, is what we use. You can also use amplitude. Uh, we we've use amplitude for glaucoma studies. So this is a normal, okay? And um, you see it's color coded. I'll talk about that in minutes. But what does an abnormal look like? So um, abnormal results would lead to a delayed implicit time, meaning it takes longer for the retina to get to get its act together, basically, to generate that peak B wave. And, and the way I explain it to my staff and other providers, it's, it, it's sort of like a race. So the faster the signal goes, the better. The shorter the time, the better. The longer the time, uh, the worse it is. Okay, so um, the, the output of the test is very neat. It gives you um, color coding with aged match controls. It's just like your OCT, your neurofiber layer, um, your, your fast Mac, uh, if you will. And so um, in the beginning, I certainly looked at the colors. After you do enough of these, you don't even need to look at the colors, you just look at the times. But just to review, if, if, if it's too fast, that's not an issue. Too slow, again, the signal's taking a long time, you're going to be in the yellow, you're going to be in the red, um, concern about cellular stress. Uh, amplitudes, again, if the amplitude is reduced, possibly cell death. So purpose of this slide is to tell you to, you, you got to use your common sense. I mean, it's just like any other test. Your OCTs, your neurofiber layers, you can get tests that are green, yellow, and red that totally make sense, or you can get some that don't make sense. And so you have to put it into context, just like your visual field test, for example. You know, there's no perfect test. And so um, you have to just kind of keep in mind the big picture and does it make sense? And we'll go over some cases and uh, it'll make a little bit more sense when we do that. Okay, so let's get to the fun part. So this is, so I've got five cases. Four of them are cataract cases and they're similar and yet different. So, so um, we'll see kind of how we use this device in, our cat in my cataract practice and really my premium cataract practice. So here's the first case. So this is a 72 year old uh, widow. She has a history of breast cancer. She was referred by an optometrist uh, for a cataract, came in with a complaint of blurred vision in both eyes, okay? Uh, on exam, she had significant cataracts in both eyes. Fundus exam showed a mild epiretinal membrane in both eyes. So we see this all the time. So the question is, how significant are those epiretinal membranes? So as soon as I start seeing this, if I'm thinking about premium cataract surgery, uh, I'm thinking, um, is this, how is this going to affect our decision making for the options of premium cataract surgery? So if you look at, so, so, so the old way, um, the old way I used to do this, and I'm sure um, everybody does this, you get an OCT. Um, so you get the OCT, you look at it, and yeah, it's abnormal. The OCT in the left eye, there's some foveal distortion. Uh, right eye is even a little bit abnormal, but it doesn't like jump out at you. Uh, everything's in the green. So, but it, you know, and if you look on that second cross section, uh, the fovea is a little bit uh, abnormal, but it's, you know, it's not, it's, it doesn't jump out at you, but it's, it's definitely abnormal, no question. So the old way of doing this, deciding what to offer cat for cataract surgery, this is it. This is all the information we really have. And so then we try to make a decision, counsel the patient, what do we do? Well, the new way, the way I do it now, when I'm at this point, I come out of the room, ask testing tech, can we do a, an ERG retina in room three? Five minutes later, it's done. Import it in my EMR, take a look at it, and it helps us decide what to do. And here it is. So again, a lot of information, forget about everything on the top. Uh, I'll show you where we're gonna uh, focus on, on the bottom. It says test two. And this is the 30 Hertz uh, implicit time, really the most important for retinal disease. So the ERG shows a significantly delayed 30 Hertz implicit time for the left eye, okay? So it's delayed compared to age match controls. It's also delayed compared to the patient's right eye. So when I see this, I say, oh, it's kind of a red flag. I stop, I go back and look at the fundus a little bit more carefully, look at the OCT a little bit more carefully. I'm like, huh, okay, maybe it's a little bit more 
concerning than I thought. And so in this case, you know, I talked to the patient, we kind of make a decision on what to do. So there you see the normal uh, for the right eye. So based on this, based on the ERG and after a discussion with the patient, in this scenario, we chose not to offer premium cataract surgery on this patient. That ERG was so dramatically different, so dramatically asymmetrical, red flags went off. And so this is a case where the ERG probably saved a less than desirable outcome for the patient. And it also saved a lot of headache for me as the surgeon. Okay, so now let's Dr. look at uh, another case. Dr. Kay, I'm sorry. I, I just, there was a couple of questions about that, that first case that I wanted to, sure. to post to you if that's okay. Sure. Um, the first question was, um, you mentioned it was important to use the 30 Hertz test. Can you yes. uh, expand on that? Yes. So, so this is what's really neat about this science, okay? So, so if you look at the top, it's a, if you look, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but at the top, it's a two hertz test, slower test. On the bottom is the 28 hertz test. That's considered the 30 hertz test. Basically, what it means is it's a much faster flicker of light. And so remember, these are, this, is, this is a full field ERG, meaning you're, you're flashing the light, the whole retina is seeing it. So, that could be a problem, right? Because you don't necessarily want all, you know, what the peripheral retina is doing. So, uh, multifocal ERGs, for example, you can fine tune where you know the signal, but those are much more complicated to pull off. So, the neat thing about this is, so you're using a full field, but it turns out if you run the flicker really, really, really fast at 30 hertz, the only part of the retina that really, really gets excited is the cones. And so and since the cones are concentrated really around the fovea, central macula, you have very little cone activity in the peripheral retina. It's a way to focus on the center part of the macula, the fovea, kind of where, you know, where the money is, if you will. And so um, that, that's why we focus on the 30 hertz implicit time. So okay, uh, great question. I had another question, another question unrelated. Um, do you bill, how do, uh, do you bill for the ERG test in this particular case? And if so, um, how would you bill for it? Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about billing at the end, but uh, sure, yeah. So, so we don't do ERGs for uh, screening, meaning, you know, we don't do it on everybody. Although I know in Europe, I, I believe it's, it's approved. Is that correct, Andrew? Yes, we have a, a, a diabetic retinopathy assessment program that's available outside the in US. Europe. Okay, so um, yeah. so the way I do it is this. So if I see the pathology, you know, we get the OCT. If there's pathology on the OCT on the exam, I'll you know I'll order the ERG. We do the ERG, and then absolutely we bill it. So you know we bill it for whatever the diagnosis is. In this case, epiretinal membrane. So yes, we do in this case. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about billing uh, at the end because it's important. Okay, so let's talk about another case. So, so this, this is similar to the last case, but it goes in the other direction. So this is a case of a 71-year-old healthy retired chiropractor. Uh, actually, him and his wife both came to see me uh, same day, both of them similar situation with cataracts. They both complain of blurred vision, uh, but he had significant cataracts in both eyes and a really significant epiretinal membrane in the right eye. Pretty, pretty impressive in that right eye. So jumps out, it's hard to miss. So of course, the old way, you get the OCT. I still do it, I get the OCT, and it's like, wow, okay, red flag, can't miss this. So, um, but the old way this is it. Based on this, I would make the decision on premium cataract surgery. And, you know, historically, I've really been a kind of a more conservative premium cataract surgery, especially when it comes to like multifocal lenses. And, um, and you know, this is one where I, I would probably in the past avoid premium cataract surgery because I was so concerned about what the macula looked like. So, but the new way now, I come out of the room, ask the testing tech, ERG retina, testing tech does it five minutes later, it's in the EMR. I look at it. Here's this patient's ERG retina. Okay. So again, look at the bottom, forget about the top, 30 hertz implicit time. So this 30 hertz implicit time is normal and symmetrical. That's the key, that it's symmetrical. Remember, that ERM in the right eye, huge, right? So, so it's a symmetrical test. So that, and, and so you can look here at 
where we're looking. Again, we're the the 27 um, milliseconds for each eye. So that is a reassuring result. And so based on that, I have more confidence in proceeding with cataract surgery in this setting. Now, again, uh, I'm a fairly conservative surgeon. I would still avoid a multifocal, but you can certainly offer blended vision uh, with a femto laser and toric lenses uh, as needed. Um, if the ERG for the right eye showed uh, a delayed 30 hertz implicit time, again, you can consider avoiding premium cataract surgery or um, skip the blended vision, just do both eyes distance, okay? So, okay. So here's another case, again, uh, very similar, but th there's a little twist to it. So this is a 74-year-old male, a retired Navy pilot, also referred from an optometrist for blurred vision and cataracts. 20-40 uh, vision in both eyes, significant cataracts on exam. Again, left eye, epiretinal membrane, though the view's a bit hazy, dense cataract, okay? So uh, again, standard way, you get the OC OCT. <coughs> You look at the macula, right eye is not too bad, left eye, you know, it jumps out. It's an abnormal um, OCT, but it's not like, okay, it's not the, the worst we've seen. And so again, the old way, we, ha we, make, we have to make a decision, what do we do, premium cataract surgery wise, um, based on this. The new way, come out of the room, testing tech, five minutes later, ERG's in the EMR, here it is. So in this case, the ERG, was significantly delayed in the left eye compared to the right eye. Uh, but if you notice, it's in the green. And so this is an important point, really for all testing, uh, but anytime you compare to age match controls. So the compared to age match controls, that implicit time is normal, right? But I don't care about age match controls because I have a control in the patient's other eye. The other eye doesn't have an epiretinal memory. So it's a normal, macula. And so in the other eye, the the implicit times 25.8 seconds. That comes out 23 percentile. In the left eye, it's 26.5, comes out 56 percentile. So based on research that we've done, in our practice, any difference of 25 percent, we consider that clinically significant. So I would say this left eye is abnormal. And again, based on this, I'm like, oh, how come they're not the same? I look a little bit more carefully at the retina, look a little bit more carefully at the OCT. And so, again, you can decide, maybe avoid the multifocal, avoid blended vision uh, in this case. And uh, this case illustrates that even if we still decide to pr uh, proceed with premium cataract surgery, the, the ERG along with the OCT and exam help us decide what to do. And in this case, uh, I avoid the riskier option of blended vision definitely avoid the multifocal and offer distance vision correction in both eyes. Now, in this case, and really in all the cases, I still explain to the patient, you have to understand the vision in the left eye may be limited to the uh, epiretinal uh, membrane. But the ERG helps refine the premium options. In the past, it was much more black and white for me, again, as a, as a more conservative premium cataract surgeon. But now, it's not just uh, yes or no premium surgery. It's like, okay, maybe we give you um, a blended vision, or maybe, or, you know, mini mono vision, blended vision, or maybe we give you both eyes distance. It opens up opportunities that I didn't feel comfortable doing in the past. Interesting thing about this case is the vision was the same in the left eye versus the right eye. So that, that couldn't help you decide uh, about the, the role of the epiretinal membrane. Okay. So let's do another case, another cataract case. And this is a 65-year-old Asian female, uh, type 2 diabetic for a long time, 20 years, big cataracts. So history of amblyopia in the right eye, referred in by an optometrist for blurred vision in both eyes and cataracts. So uh, on exam, 2070 in the right, 2040 in the left, very, very hazy view, as you can see. Um, and these are really dense cataracts. We see this all the time, right, diabetics. And so... You know, I thought there was something a little bit funny about the, the fovea in the left eye. I couldn't get a great view. Maybe there was an epiretinal membrane. So the standard way or the old way, come out, get the OCT. You look at the OCT. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, right eye, it's a, it's, it looks pretty good. Left eye, you know, maybe there's something a little bit abnormal. It's hard to tell for sure. 
Um, there, it could, is it art, artifact? I mean, it's a dense lens. Look at the signal strength on left eye. It's not all that great. So in the past, this is essentially all we had. I had to make a decision. What do I do for this patient's premium cataract surgery? Again, as a conservative premium cataract surgeon, you know, this would be a little bit um, concerning for me. Do we offer multifocal lenses if the macula could be abnormal? Okay. So the new way now is I add the ERG. Come out of the room, testing tech, five minutes later, ERG is imported in EMR. I take a look at it. And again, look at the bottom, 30 hertz implicit time. Right eye, normal. Left eye, normal. Symmetrical in both eyes. So in cases where the view to the fundus is bad and the OCT is of low quality, ERG can help detect for possible retinal pathology, right? This happens a lot. I mean, you get these dense cataract patients and you, you know, it's tough to tell for sure uh, what's going on behind the cataract. And, uh, and, and for me, this is one of the, the, the more powerful uses of ERG. Uh, in, in dense cataracts where the exam and imaging are limited value, ERG can help. Because remember, the 30 hertz implicit time is not affected by media opacity. So in this case, based on the ERG, it's okay to proceed with premium cataract surgery. And we offer multifocal lenses to this patient. Okay, so those first, first four cases were cataract cases and macula or retinal ERG uh, cases. Okay, so I'm change, change it up here a little bit. So this is going to be a glaucoma case. Now the glaucoma ERG is different. It's different than the 30 hertz implicit time. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, challenging to do uh, because it's an amplitude based test. And so, um, you know, I'll talk about, I'll show you how it's a little bit different um, compared to the 30 hertz implicit time, but this is a case where uh, the ERG can help you. All right. So this is a 66-year-old male, a history of cataract surgery in the left eye. Um, unfortunately, this patient was lost to follow-up and came in uh, after several years presenting for blurred vision in both eyes. The patient had a history of multiple back surgeries and had a significant cataract uh, in the right eye. Okay, um, patient had cupping on exam, about 0.7 in each eye but uh, did look like there was a notch superiorly in the left eye. So what, what do you do with these typical, uh, these, these cases? Standard of care, visual field test first, okay? So we get the visual field test, right eye looks like, uh, you know, a lid artifact, um, left eye inferior defect, and probably um, uh, correlates to the notch uh, in the nerve, superior part of the nerve. Okay, next thing, old way again, OCT. So I get a nerve fiber layer and uh, you see cupping in both eyes, okay? Um, the nerve fiber layer, it's, it's certainly abnormal in the left eye, but you know, it's abnormal in both eyes. And maybe it's a little bit worse in the left eye, um, but you know, they, they look about the same. So, the, so here's the dilemma in, in this situation. So the patient's sitting there in your chair, you have to decide what to do. There's optic nerve damage to the, to the left eye, patient has a significant cataract surgery in the right eye, but the view to the nerve on the right eye is confounded due to the dense lens. And so the field doesn't help you. Um, and so, and the, the OCT is, looks about the same. So what do we do? So the, the old way, again, we have to make a decision at this point, but the new way, what I do is I come out, ask for this time, glaucoma ERG, testing tick does it, imports it and we review it. So this is so this is what a glaucoma ERG looks like. This is not the patients. I'll show you the patients in a second. I kind of wanted to show you roughly what a normal looks like. Again, a ton of information in there. Don't let that kind of scare you away. Um, I will show you where you have to look, okay? Uh, but so, so where we want to look is, so th this is the photopic negative response. It is the response of the ganglion cell layer, okay? And it is, the, the, the measurement that we use for glaucoma is an amplitude-based measurement, okay? And so that means that the reason I said it's harder to pull off, the electrode position matters much more when you're trying to get an amplitude position. So in the beginning, um, researchers, really smart researchers, when they were looking at this, 
Um, they were using amplitude of the photopic neg negative response alone to determine if there's glaucoma or if there's a problem at the ganglion cell layer. Well, it turns out you can't do that because, again, it's an amplitude-based test. If the overall test is diminished for, for whatever reason, say dense cataracts or if the electrode position is a little bit off, well, the photop photopic negative response is going to be off because the overall electrical activity is off. So then these smart researchers, scientists decided, well, why don't we make a ratio? So that's what we use. And there's two different ratios right now, and um, I, we use both of them. And so we look at the P ratio and the W ratio. Okay, basically, these are two different ways to look at the relative response of the ganglion cell to the overall retinal function, or really the bipolar function. But so does that make sense? So that's, that's what's uh, neat and really key about this. So we look at the P ratio. Okay, so this was a standard. Let's look at my patient with glaucoma, glaucoma in the left eye. What kind of glaucoma does he have in his right eye? What do we offer surgical wise? So uh, again, a lot to look at. We're gonna focus in here. So in this case, the photopic negative response, P ratio, W ratio, significantly depressed. And so it's green, but again, I don't care necessarily about that it's green because I wanna compare it to the other eye. Uh, and the other eye, it's much more normal, okay? Because I know the patient has glaucoma damage to the left eye, but I wanna know how much damage in their right eye, much better result uh, in the right eye, okay? So the left one, great example of um, early glaucoma atrophy, damage with visual field loss. Uh, in the right eye, much better. So because the glaucoma ERG of the right eye is significantly better than the left eye, it's a reassuring result. So when I see this, this gives me confidence in proceeding with premium cataract surgery uh, in this case. Now, again, uh, I tend to be a more conservative uh, premium cataract surgeon. So because of the potential glaucoma down the road, I'd probably avoid a multifocal. You can decide for yourself what you wanna do, especially after you have that discussion with the patient. I guess it depends on how old the patient is. But you could certainly consider an extended depth of focus or toric lens or, um, or femto. Okay, so those are my cases. Um, let's talk a little bit about billing. There were some questions earlier uh, about uh, billing. So the code that we use is listed right there. It's the 92273, this is the full field ERG. And the di diagnosis code that we use varies, it depends. So for, for this four, first four cases, uh, you know, it would be, we would do that CPT code and we would do, you know, you could do epiretinal memory or you can do, you know, blurred vision. Um, and uh, th that's the reimbursement. And that's about uh, the reimbursement, maybe a little bit on the higher side, but that's about what, uh, what we see. Now, um, um, you know, certainly covered by Medicare, most uh, private Medicare plans. I, I think the key about this is you really have to learn your local payers. So, uh, you know, we've learned over the years, our local payers, and we know uh, fairly well, although things change constantly, which makes it difficult, but uh, we know um, if there's a payer, for example, that doesn't cover a test for specific diagnosis, we try to avoid it. Because, you know, I, you know, I don't like to get the patient stuck with the bill. The patient's not happy. So we try to, unless it's absolutely necessary. So, but that's the uh, billing. And if there are other questions at the end, we can kind of talk about that some more. Okay. So now I talked about some cases, four cases, epiretinal membranes, um, and a glaucoma case. Now we are really just scratching the surface, okay? There are lots and lots of other uses, lots and lots of other ways that I use the, the, the device in my practice. Diabetic retinopathy, vascular occlusion. So vascular disease, these are some of the most, if you look at the study, some of the most valid and reproducible data on ERG is in cases of vascular occlusions, vein occlusions, um, artery occlusions, and diabetic retinopathy. And so we use it, it helps us decide 
for example, how if we want, do I want to see a patient back sooner? Do I want to see a patient later? Do I treat a patient? Do I not treat a patient? And so it's very, very useful for these cases. So we also use the device for patients with significant drusen and macular degeneration. And there is a neat study that came out in 2014 in Italy. And basically, it's a Drusen contralateral eye study. So basically, what they did is they looked at in, uh, an individual eye and uh, with Drusen, OK? And they ran the ERG retina, the 30 hertz implicit time. And they had um, lots of normals, but they had some abnormals. And so a significant number of the abnormal ERG retinas, the 30 hertz implicit time, with Drusen alone, if you looked at the patient's contralateral eye, the patient had wet macular degeneration in that eye. In other words, the ERG could predict which patients had wet macular degeneration in the other eye, which is really neat if you think about it. So now how, how is it doing that? I mean, it's not really predicting it. What it's doing is it's the ERG, electrophysiology testing can somehow pick up something that's going on in these eyes with drusen alone that we cannot see. But there's something going on that increases the risk of wet macular degeneration because the patient has wet macular degeneration in the other eye. And so when I saw that study, that, this is one of the studies that really got me interested in this uh, technology. So other uses, uh, toxicity, um, lots of uses for uh, toxicity. Um, we, we certainly use it. And there, is, there are electrodes also for visual evoked potentials. And so we use it for optic nerve disease, uh, non-glaucoma optic nerve disease, for example, optic neuritis patients. So um, it can be very, very useful. So. OK, so that's it. So um, I wanted to save some time for if there are questions. And I'll let you guys kind of think it, you know, think it through if there's any questions. Um, going back to how we started the talk, here's a picture of uh, the first EKG, or one of the first EKGs, circa 1911. I thought it was neat. And it shows the manner in which the electrodes are attached to the patient. In this case, the hands and one foot of the patient are immersed in jars of salt solution. So this is circa 1911, 100 years ago. We've certainly come a long way in cardiology, we've come a long way in neurology. I think we've got a ways to go in uh, ophthalmology, and this is the way to do it. So um, thank you. So if there's any questions, we can kind of go over them now. Yes, uh, Dr. K, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I had a few uh, questions. Um, the first one is from Dr. Meyer, and it goes back to, I think, the, the first case, but it, I think it can equally be applied to all the cases. How, if you were to, or if you would have gone through and put in a premium lens when you know you decided not to, uh, what what kind of outcomes would you expect? How do you think the patient would have been dissatisfied? Yeah, so the pro, you know, um, if you're a if you're a multifocal surgeon or a premium cataract surgeon, especially in the beginning, I mean, I've learned the hard way uh, over the years. Let's go back to it. You will um, you will have some. Um, is the first case. Well, either case, if the OCT looks like this. So you will have some cases where you'll have unhappy patients. Well, you'll have unhappy patients no matter what, no matter what you do. So the, you, know, you, tr you wanna try to use as much, um, as much information as you can to fine tune that decision, to help you make that decision. What do I do? Because I really want happy patients. I, I can't stand having unhappy patients. But at the same time, I think I was a little bit too conservative in the, in the past. So this test gives me more confidence. So if, if the ERG is significantly abnormal, then I will say no. Because if I put that multifocal lens in and that the, the patient with the significant delayed 30 hertz implicit time, there's going to be visual problems in that patient after the cataract surgery, especially with the multifocal lens. And so that's why I avoid it. I mean, you know, you know, there's patients that we've done it before, you know, we, we've learned from our mistakes, but this is a way to really evaluate the patients to fine tune that, uh, that, that selection. So it saves a lot of headache. So hopefully that answers the question there. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. K. Um, I had another uh, a question from Dr. Ambrosio, um, and I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Let me read it out and see if see if you do. It sure. says, uh, "How do you interpret um, the photopic ERG? In some cases, the photopic ERG was altered. Also, how do you exclude a more diffuse RD?" Uh, so. I guess, um, so I don't know if we're talking about the photopic negative response or the, the 30 hertz implicit time, but so, um, you know, the way I use the ERG, it's very, you know, I have, there's a question that I have. So, for example, those cases where there's an epiretinal membrane, my question is, um, and, and there's not one in the other eye, for example, my question is, well, well how much does this affect the, the function uh, of the eye? of the retina, of the macula. And so uh, I go in there looking for specific information. You know, again, I'm not, I'm not using it uh, as a screening test. You certainly can. And, um, but, I, you know, I don't use the, 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 the lower hertz test, which tests the whole retina. I focus on the 30 hertz test. So I imagine if you did it enough, you can learn, you use the two hertz test at the top to get a kind of overall um, measurement of retinal function. And if you're looking for something like a retinal, so retinal detachment, severe retinal disease, it, the cool thing about this, it's obvious, it catches it. So if you're not sure if a patient, you know, occasionally you get a patient where you think, gosh, I think they might've had a CRAO, but they're outside of that window of, you know, the cherry red spot's gone, the, the, it's, the retina looks normal again. It's like a healthy retina, but the vision's down. What, what the heck happened? The ERG will pick it up. And it's it's not subtle. It's obvious. The 30 hertz will, will pick it up. Uh, so will the other one, and, and, and so will the two hertz. You can look at amplitude. Amplitude will definitely be affected by retinal detachment, uh, artery occlusion, uh, vascular occlusion. So, so there's lots of ways to use this device. And I, I think um, you know, Andrew, you can comment a little bit about you know, it's not just for ophthalmology, but um, uh, you know, I focus because there's a lot of information on here. And, uh, you know, so I, I focus and, you know, when I, you know, we have uh, physicians who, who work at our practice, the way I teach them, focus on 30 hertz implicit time, the photopic negative response. Those are the most valid, most re reproducible tests. Um, there's good data on those. We really have a lot of experience in our practice uh, with those tests. So that's what I focus on. But, you know, but we're, we're, we're a cataract practice, general ophthalmology practice, you know, retina practices can use the, there's, I mean, I don't know how many tests are there, Andrew, for uh, with your device. Oh, there's there's well more. It's thirty plus tests, and there's yeah, um, there's, exactly. Uh, so I I think it's too many. I keep telling Andrew, take them <laughs> off. I don't, you know, if you're sending them to cataracts, or to take them off. You only need two tests. But uh, you know, you can you know you can use uh, as many tests in the company. Uh, you know, they they will help you uh, set up um, your your testing protocols uh, in the beginning. They're very supportive. I'm very knowledgeable about it. And so uh, these are how we use it in our practice, so. Yes, yes, thank you, Dr. K. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, you could do light adapted, dark adapted tests. Uh, there's a full suite of uh, ISEV approved testing protocols. And like you mentioned, you can also do VEP tests when you have the, uh, the different electrodes. Um, I did have a question about how difficult is the learning curve for reading the reports? But I think I think you may have answered that. But I don't know yeah, if you have any other comments. That's a good question. Yeah. So if you're doing, if you're if you're if you're a cataract surgeon, general ophthalmologist, you want to do the way, you know, kind of like what I described. It's easy. All you know, if you want to start off just with retina studies, all you care about is the 30 hertz implicit time. And so if you can read an OCT you can do this. It's really simple. All you care about is time. It's one measurement. You want to know when did that B wave peak? And if you don't know what the B wave is, you can just kind of Google it again, look at it again, or the company will show you again. You can email me, call me, they can connect you with me. I'll show you. It's really easy. It's that implicit time. And again, I, you know, I can't stress this enough because it, it is, it's really, you know, taking advantage of the biology. The fact that the implicit time, you, you can't affect it by, you know, media opacity, by patient cooperation, by electrode placement, if the patient has makeup on their face, it won't affect it. If you can generate electrical response, there's, there's only going to be one implicit time. And if you do it over and over again, it's very reproducible, very valid for that patient's particular physiology or pathophysiology. 
So that, you know, that's what we use. And then, you know, we added the glaucoma test again. It's a little bit more difficult because the photopic uh, negative response, the electrodes have to be um, more precise. You'll see a little bit more artifact. Um, but um, it's, it's very quick. And, you know, there, you, you can get artifact in the testing. Interesting, one of our offices, when, you know, we figured out when we started doing the test, you know, the wires in the wall, for example, it's just this one room, we don't know why, uh, would cause artifact. The machine was picking up uh, electric, just shows you how, how sensitive these electrodes are, how good these electrodes are. It's picking up electrical activity uh, in, in, in the walls. You know, none of our other offices, none of the rooms have it, this, just this one. Um, so, but it, you know, it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy. Once you start doing it, you, you will get a feel for it. And so, you, you know, we started it, we jumped right in, you know, we did it uh, on all our patients that we thought could benefit from it. The diabetic patients, the Drusen patients, uh, the epiretinal membrane patients, the vascular occlusion patients. We, we did a lot. You have to learn. This is, this is a new technology. And, you know, I kind of, if you think about how, you know, where we are with OCT of the optic nerve, for example, where the imaging is or imaging of the Mac, it's, it's gotten pretty decent. But even if I look at my first OCTs from the, the, the practice when we started, or if you think about HRT, you know, the more you do this, the more the technology improves, it gets better and better and better. And so that's why I encourage everyone to embrace this technology. And because I think there's so many possibilities for all sorts of diseases. Glaucoma, I think, has the most potential. It is challenging. Um, it is more challenging than 30 hertz implicit time, but I think the big reward to society if we can if we can really get that down. What other questions? Yes, Dr. K. I guess this kind of relates to other uh, utilizations. Have you ever? Um, let me just grab this here. Have you ever uh, used the VEP um, a functionality when looking at patients with MS or optic neuritis? Um, we do. We do, yeah. The, so the one thing about um, the um, the VEP is uh, so this. V, so we had another device, um, ERG device, VEP device before this, and that device now it's a dinosaur. But um, you know that VEP was a pattern VEP. So that gives you a little bit more information for optic nerve diseases. This VEP is a flash VEP. So the way we use it in our practice is as follows. You, we compare the right eye to the left eye, or we compare what we think is a diseased eye or non-diseased eye to itself over time. In other words, we don't use the data, the data that we get, we don't use it to compare it to other people because it's hard. It's very specific for an individual patient. It's tough to get age-matched controls because you know, the VEP, what you're looking at, again, it's visual evoked potential. You know, I tell patients, I tell my staff, it's like a, the, 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 the mile high view, the blimp view of what's going on. And there's a lot of variability from, 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 from really the, the cornea to the, the, the occipital lobe. And so really the most, the, the best way to do it is to compare the right eye to the left eye. And so you have to think there has to be a question that the test can answer. And so if you're concerned, does this patient have optic neuritis, you can run the test of right eye compared to left eye and look at the, you can look at the amplitudes, you can look at the time uh, to peaks and, um, and, and it can answer those questions. Or if you're following the patient over time where you see a diseased eye, you wanna get a sense, is the disease process abating? Is it getting worse? You can repeat it and compare it to, to the prior study. So, but we like the VEPs. Again, the electrodes are a little bit different. Um, you put electrode in the back of the head, uh, it has to stick to the back of the head. Sometimes that's an issue. We have patients, uh, for example, with wigs or patients have something in their uh, in their hair, but you know, we can pull it off. So that's VEP. Great. What else? Thank you very much, Dr. K. Dr. K, I had a couple of questions which I might be able to answer and then another one which is kind of a, a, a follow-up to that. So someone was asking how much does the Redival cost? And so in the United States, it costs um, $17,250. Um, and then the question I think follows up with that, how would you rate, I mean, obviously in, in um, you have to con be concerned about economics, how would you rate kind of how Redival provides an ROI and kind of an impact for your practice? Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, it's huge. Like I said, it's changed the way I approach decision-making for all sorts of diseases. And so, you know, we, we really have to open our eyes. It's really difficult in medicine, change is difficult in medicine. 
And so it's almost like there's a whole nother dimension that we're, we're, we haven't been looking at, right? And so it's huge. And so if you think about the possibilities, it's huge. So it's unbelievable re return on the investment for the for the profession, for optimal. I mean, look at the cardiologist, look at the neurologist. So um, we really, really, I, I think, you know, need to invest in um, this diagnostic technology. If we don't, you know, we're not going to go anywhere. The, the, as far as like for the practice, like from the business standpoint, I mean, I, it, you know, the return on investment from a practice standpoint is, is, is quick. I mean, it's within months, I mean, depending on your volume. You know, again, we, we jumped right in because, you know, I kind of geeked out on the science of it and I kind of liked it. Again, I had experience with, with the rabbits, but you certainly don't have to. But I mean, you know, if you're seeing diabetic retinopathy patients, if you've got macular degeneration patients, you know, if there's one little drusen or two little drusens, not significant. I'm, you know, I'm not doing the test, but you know, you, you'll figure out which tests make sense. Um, and then again, you know, the the vascular occlusions, and and then the optic optic neuritis patients and other um, um, optic nerve diseases. So, uh, you know, I think I think it's a bargain. But uh, for society, for practices, you know, I think we should all jump in. But you know, but uh, yeah. Excellent. So, what else? What other questions? Well, thank you. Yeah, Dr. K. So I'm I'm not seeing any other questions. If there are if there are questions that we miss or or if question comes in after the fact, I'll uh, you know definitely work with Dr. K to to answer those questions for you. Um, hey, I just uh, like to thank you very much, Dr. K, for uh, all of your help. Um, thank you. If you have any further questions or, or if you would like to follow up with the um, uh, questions about the Redival, uh, please feel free uh, to uh, reach out to either myself and um, uh, if you can go back a slide just for a second, Dr. K, there is uh, either myself at a Jones at lkc.com uh, LKC or Ian McMillan uh, at Conan Medical who are our US distributor. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We can give you uh, uh, answer any questions that you may have. Um, if you can go to the next slide, there is, actually we are offering a special promotion right now um, for the Redival, and we understand how uh, difficult it is uh, these days with uh, uh, the pandemic and, and the closures and things like that. So we've put together a special promotion to try and eliminate some of the risks, some of the cash flow issues with bringing a device like Redival into your practice. And so this special offer is no payments for six months and followed by six payments of $50 for the next six months and then uh, following up with regular payments after that. So hopefully that will address some of the cash flow um, issues that you may be dealing with right now. Um, we'll be sending out more details in terms of uh, this presentation uh, to everybody who's attended and the presentation will also be on our website if you'd like to go back and look at it again. I'd like to uh, thank you very much, Dr. K, for a, a great presentation. I uh, really appreciate that. I'd like sure, to thank Andrew. everybody else for attending today. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, if you can go back uh, to the emails, I, you know, so sure. I, I've certainly talked to, um, you know, if you're interested in this device and you don't know, you know, you certainly can connect me uh, to, to anybody and you've done it in the past. I'm happy to do it. Oh, okay. I'm happy to talk to people about our experience. It's just kind of fun. Uh, to kind of talk about how we use it and we exchange you know, when people do get it we exchange ideas so um, you know let everybody know if they want to reach out to me you, you certainly can connect them excellent thank you very much dr k appreciate it so once again thank you very much everybody for attending we wish you all of you and your families continued health and safety and uh, once again we appreciate you for, uh, for joining us today thank you very much and have a good uh, afternoon or good evening thank you andrew